So it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, uh, thanks especially to Merdad and Paul for inviting me. And I hope I, hope I can um, entertain you for 25 minutes. I'm going to talk about nematodes, uh, my favorite small beast. Um, ought to be all your favorite small beasts as well. Many of you have been hosts to nematode parasites at some time in your youth. Maybe some of you are carrying them now. Um, and um, if you ever want to barcode something that you know somebody has never barcoded before, barcode a nematode because um, they are severely neglected. So um, I'm going to start with uh, the thanks. Um, this, this work was done by a, an undergrad. The work, the bit of science I'm going to talk about rather than, rather than uh, thoughts and ideas was done by an undergraduate student, Clara Flintrop, who is now off doing a, a marine biology diversity master's course and was done in collaboration with Martin Jones, a biomathematician in our institute. I work with a team of, of wonderful genome uh, technologists at Edinburgh Genomics, and Marion Thompson helped us very much with this. Okay, this is a quote from um, Nathan Cobb in an obscure journal uh, published in the, in the US, and he imagined taking away the entirety of the planet except for nematodes. He was a parasitologist, he was trying to emphasize that these nematodes were everywhere, and that you'd still be able to see all the land masses, but you'd especially still be able to see the plants, because they're infested with nematodes, and the animals. You maybe wouldn't see the entirety of the animal, but you'd see animals wandering around, the guts of the animals wandering around with their parasites inside. Now, the wonders of modern technology means that we can now do this. Um, Nathan Cobb's absolutely right. Nematodes are incredibly abundant. And there's a wonderful series of studies done in uh, the ex-Soviet Union, uh, Platnova and Valisova, who counted hundreds of thousands of myobenthic, that's tiny, about one millimeter body length organisms, in the White Sea, the beaches of the White Sea, and decided that nematodes corresponded to about 95% of the organisms they picked out of the White Sea. Uh, John Lambshead has done similar calculations and estimated that of all the animals on the planet, this is including the arthropods, of all the animals on the planet, most of the individuals are nematodes. So nematodes rule, simply. I've got, I've got my Society of Nematology t-shirt on just to prove it. In terms of species, we only have 23,000 described species. That number is going up year on year. There are still nematologists describing species. The estimates of the number of nematode species range from about 1 million, which is a, a reasonable and conservative estimate, to the original estimate that John Lambs had made in this Oceanus paper of 100 million. Um, I think the difference between those two numbers just tells you we don't know. And that's an important thing. So the wonders of my own technology, with Google, I can take planet Earth, this is from Google Earth, and I can take away the planet, just as Nathan Cobb suggested, and leave behind just the nematodes and demonstrate how abundant they are. So if I just click to the next slide, what I've done is cleverly color the marine nematodes blue. <laughs> the nematodes of terrestrial ecosystems, I've sorted into those that are generally um, found in more uh, water-rich habitats, green, and the ones that are found in xeric habitats, such as deserts, yellow. So I think you can see from this, this map that nematodes are everywhere and are hyperabundant. Um, okay, it's a joke, but really, if you do this, everywhere you will find nematodes. Um, in Death Valley, underneath the creosote bushes, there are hundreds and hundreds of nematodes. In Antarctica, in the dry valleys, there are nematodes. So nematodes are everywhere, nematodes are important. I started my career working initially in, in nematology in uh, parasites, and I moved on to the, the model nematodes, Cinerobditis elegans. And the parasites I worked on were filarial nematodes of humans. They're about 8 to 10 centimeters long, so they're quite big, macrofauna. Um, C. elegans is also quite big. It's about a millimeter long. And we started working on, on nematodes of soils, and I realized that I couldn't identify these nematodes. And I asked taxonomists, and they said, oh, it's very difficult, even the best nematode taxonomists. So we quite quickly um, decided, because I was doing nematode uh, phylogeny as well, that we, we would use DNA sequences to identify nematodes. And that got around my problem, which is I'm a bad morphologist, but also got around a problem in the nematode community, which is that there are only a few experts around who could identify all those small nematodes in soil. And so we published in, just before Paul's paper, um, uh, a paper suggesting we should use molecular barcodes, DNA barcodes for identifying soil nematodes. And the rest is history. And uh, 
it's been amazing to watch DNA barcoding really take off. So when I was pr promoting this idea to the nematologist, there was actually quite um, a lot of encouragement and uh, enthusiasm for it, because we know that 23,000 species is a severe underestimate. And, and I look at the, the Linnaean project, and Paul was talking about the, the huge projects in biology. This is one, of, or in science or in, in human endeavor, this is one of the hugest projects ever. It's cost billions. There's no way it hasn't cost billions. And it, and it has been incredibly successful. This Linnaean project underpins so much of what we know about biology, about what we know about crop production, animal production, what we know about biodiversity, and, uh, and the security of the planet. It has taken 250 to 300 years, however, to get to the position we're at at the moment. And if we look at the number of described species per phylum, and this is slightly out of date, but um, and the, bl the blue, blue greenish uh, columns here, number of described species per phylum. Obviously, arthropods rule. Note that it is actually a, a logarithmic scale here. Arthropods rule. Nematodes are way behind. So what we have is, is uh, a huge amount of described diversity. But going from the current state of described diversity to the completed Linnaean project is a Sisyphean task. So it's a task that's going to take forever. Um, this is how Lewis Carroll put it in Alice Through the Looking Glass, the Walsh and the Carpenter standing looking at the beach and lamenting about how much sand there was and how long it will take to, to brush it away. Do you suppose that we can identify all the species? I doubt it, said the Carpenter, and shed a bitter tear. So it's a Sisyphean project. It's a project which will take all of us forever to name all the taxa on the planet. Um, I speak about uh, charismatic megabiota. And to most people, that means a giraffe. And to me, it means something that's bigger than about two millimeters. And if you work on something that's bigger than two millimeters, you're really lucky, because you can see your organism. It's probably got morphology that you can distinguish. But most animal life on the planet is less than two millimeters. Most animal life on the planet is less than two millimeters. So we have a Sisyphean project of completing the Linnaean, a Sisyphean task of completing the Linnaean ta uh, project. Remember, Sisyphus was, was condemned by the gods to rolling this rock up the hill, and just as it got to the top every, every evening, it would roll back down again, you have to start the next day. And this was punishment for being cheeky. Okay. But, of course, all life, and I'm, I'm particularly biased towards nematodes and metazoans in general, um, all life has DNA. We have a com common origin with all other uh, uh, species on the planet. And obviously, we can use that DNA to generate a barcode. And it doesn't matter if it's just a nondescript little nematode, beautiful as it is, or a giraffe. We can stick that barcode to the nematode and identify where it fits. And that's, that's what's been amazing about this meeting, just seeing how far this barcode project has, has got and how absolutely successful it is. There are always edge cases. There are always barcodes that don't correspond to species, species that don't correspond to barcodes, mitochondria that intergress between things. Those are edge cases. They're important. They're exciting biology, but the project has worked. And so I think that's where we are now. Yeah? So we've changed the, the Sisyphean task of um, really getting a handle on new taxa to something that is rolling a, a boulder along the road. It's going to be still going to be a very long road. Oh, there are a lot of you. <laughs> um, it's still going to be a very long road. But at least, at least there's other people uh, doing it. There's, um, yeah, well, okay. And, and the, the project is, is so powerful because already we can build a tree of life from DNA sequences. So this is from the Time Tree of Life by Blair Hedges and Sudhir Kumar. And they used barcode data, CO1 data, in part, to build this tree. So the, and, and all the other trees that have been shown. So I think the barcode project is working. It's rolling along. Um, it maybe needs to upscale if we're going to complete it within our lifetimes. But it's much better than the Sisyphean Linnaeus project. So the question is, how do we get to these ones? And this one doesn't work either. <laughs> Try another one. 
staying on. Okay, how do we get to these ones? Remember, this is a log scale, so th these are orders of magnitude change. And the important thing about this log scale is as we get up these bars, the taxa get smaller and smaller. The ones that haven't been described are all the small ones. And they're also, also ones which nobody has ever looked at. So these things, these are, are uh, Maya fauna from, from beaches, beautiful SEMs. Um, some of them, you probably guess what they are, ostracods, etc. Others you may never have seen before. And they are all beautiful, but they're all very, very small. They're all crowded with morphology, but if you look at several different taxa, they all look pretty much the same to us. They can tell each other apart, they know who, know who to have sex with, but uh, to us it's very difficult. So that's where metabarcoding comes in, and I'm really interested in this specimen-independent metabarcoding process, where we survey an ecosystem to find organisms that we didn't know were there, so organisms we've never seen, and to use that either as a pointer to real taxonomists and real biologists, if you like, to go in and find those organisms, find their morphology and describe them, but also so we can just use the diversity we find with DNA um, just to do directly to do um, biology. So this is Clara's honors project. This is our rainforest ecosystem. I think it's even better than Charles Godfrey's Meadow. This is the physics lecture theater on our campus. It faces south. This is the back wall, the north wall. As you all know, it rains sometimes in Scotland. And and the sun shines sometimes. This doesn't see the sun, but it sees a lot of rain and, and uh, diffuse light from, from up above. Um, it is covered with essentially a monocrop of either Marcantia polymorpha liverwort or a mixture of mosses. Obviously, there's in interaction between these two. So the, the ecosystem can be divided into two, liverwort versus moss. If you're a very small organism, this is a rainforest. So we're interested in what animals live in this rainforest. Um, so we did that using MySeq. I used to use the 454 for doing metabarcoding. I got really depressed by 454 data. I'm sorry if there's anybody from four, Roche 454 in, in the audience or anybody who still loves 454 data. I really hated it that um, all the PCR and the stutter in the sequencing generated all these variants which were just machine noise and that depending on the algorithm I used to analyze the data, I got a different roster of OTUs. Um, I find that uh, entirely unsatisfactory, that actually what I'm mostly doing is analyzing machine noise. Um, the Illumina sequencers um, solve that for me. Um, we can generate millions and millions of sequences. We can be absolutely rigorous about throwing away low quality data. Um, and we can generate quite long paired end sequences such we end up with 400, 500 base fragments, and that, that'll get longer and longer. And we can also classify these into OTU with, by whatever method we like. And on this wonderful ecosystem, hyperdiverse ecosystem, we found something like 8,000 OTU that we could name to genus. So this is using 18S rather than cytochromophores 1. So the reason we've been using 18S is because we have more universal primers. If we want to focus on, on ectisozoa or arthropods, and we would use different uh, primer, but we can identify 7,800. Um, for the abundant ones, it's about 200. 200 taxa sitting underneath there. And you can do ecology with these. So first of all, we can ask what's there. Hooray, nematodes win. Um, both in terms of OTU and in terms of numbers of sequences, um, it's nem nematoda wins outright. The most frequent motu is plectus. This is the one we see down the microscope. Um, but importantly, plectus, we found uh, 600,000 sequences in this data set which were base identical. 600,000 sequences which were base identical after the sequencing. No machine noise. Yeah. So I, I, it, it, the... The world has changed, and we can now do it. There are nine animal phyla represented. Those of you with eyes, which are good, will notice we found core data, and all you, you, you may be saying, oh, that's humans, you contaminate with human. This is actually a, a pigeon, and those of you will notice that there's obviously pigeons sitting up here. <laughs> so we didn't collect much pigeon, but we collected some pigeon. Um, there are eight other phyla here, including gastrotrichs. How many people have ever seen a gastrotrich? 
Hooray! <laughs> beautiful beasts, beautiful beasts. There are lots of tardigrades, my second favorite organism after um, nematodes. Flatworms, flatworms that we'd miss by doing usual formalin-based morphological surveys, because a small flatworm, these are micro flatworms, when you put formalin on it, scrumples up to just like a little piece of, of rolled up brown paper, and you wouldn't identify it as a flatworm. So we've suddenly got access to the biodiversity in this ecosystem. Well, Clara has, and Clara's not, um, uh, well, was an undergraduate student. We can do ecology, so this is, um, plotting the proportional presence of the OTUs between uh, liverwort samples and moss samples. Here's Plectus, Plectus aquatilis. It's absolutely equally divided between the two sites. That's good. Or the two sample types, this is, this is the mean of three. But we have a number of taxa which are overrepresented in liverwort, a number of animal taxa that are overrepresented in moss. They happen to be tardigrades, which is fun. Um, but we can do ecology with these things. We don't actually need to know what these are. We can immediately say these are interesting things that are responding to our sampling or treatment. So I think, for me, that we can reduce the cost of this per sample to a very small amount. We can multiplex deeply. We can use the, the new uh, higher throughput uh, sequencing machines and generate vast amounts of data. So back in that paper in 2002, uh, we co coined this name MOTU, Molecular Operational Taxonomic Units. And I just want to assure you all, it's not just an acronym. It really does mean something. And um, it's actually a word in Polynesian. And many of the Polynesian languages, including Tahiti and Easter Island, retain this word motu as, as, a, as a stem word, which is used for describing a lot of things. So it has two absolutely key meanings. One is the meaning to cut or to snap off. So I regard that as, as an analogy to our defining operational taxonomic units as things which are distinct from others. So, motuate hao means to cut off, uh, to snap the fishing line off. This is motuate animals or plants, or whatever. This is snapping them off, defining them as separate things. The other one is to engrave or inscribe. And on Easter Island, there's this uh, uh, rogo rogo, which are un uninterpretable pa wooden panels carved with these amazing designs, which are not translatable, there's no Rosetta Stone for them. But they're called motu, and they are the names. They are um, engraved or inscribed. So we're not only cutting things off, we're also naming them. And of course, absolutely perfectly, it also means islet. So we're cutting things off to be islets. So there are all these names of little islets around Easter Island, which are called motu. So I think motu is, is a lovely word. It comes from Polynesian. It also happens to be an acronym, but um, it does have a background in, in thinking about how, how uh, exactly what we're doing with these MOTUs. So MOTUs approximately equal to bins from the sense of bold systems. They don't equal species, so they're not the same as species. But they often approximate to species or to cryptic species. And especially if we can do multi-locus barcoding from individual specimens, they really will equate to species. But I think that often here means that we can actually use them in the same way um, in ecology and um, ecosystem assessment as, other, as we would other things. The beauty is they're entirely transferable between systems. This is kind of, a, 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 I, th I think we should be using MOTU or BINs um, as, our, as our identifiers, and I agree that they're rather boring Calling something number 164 is very different from calling it uh, Elaphus elaphus. But so in, in the Linnaean system, barcoding and Linnaean system is essentially a platonic, a platonic relationship. And I mean that in terms of Plato and the definition of, of pure solids. That pure things are defined, barcodes are defined that help identify those, and barcodes are for additional characters which improve Linnaean taxonomy. If we start doing specimen-based community barcoding, and I've used the example of the Astraptes uh, uh, caterpillars here, we can start discovering new taxa and cryptic taxa and improve the Linnaean uh, system, but we still need the Linnaean system taxonomic framework to do that. What we have in this uh, barcoding soup or in this wonderful uh, picture from uh, Victorian London monster soup is a way of surveying for new taxa, which are then going to drive 
uh, discovery efforts. Where do we go to look for the three millionth species that we want to barcode and identify and describe? And also starting to really probe ecosystems. And I think the important thing here is I, I doubt that in my lifetime, the Linnaean project is going to get beyond a few times 10 to the 6 taxa. I think there are 10 to the 8 taxa on the planet. I'm quite happy to have discussions with people about why I'm over-optimistic or stupid. But I think the only way we're going to get to those 10 to the 8 taxa or even approach that is by doing uh, specimen-independent community barcoding. And it's all symbiotic. It all feeds into each other. But I think the majority of our ecology work and our survey work is going to be done especially with the tiny organisms, is going to be done with specimen-independent community barcoding. There are going to spe be species out there which are incredibly important, which we've never seen. If they're really important, we will find them, we will grow them, we will describe them. But just as in microbial barcoding, the, the most abundant bacterium in the sea um, only appeared as a 16S sequence for many years. Now it's cultured. But for many years, we knew that the most abundant cellular organism in the sea was something we didn't know uh, what it looked like, um, I think that's going to be true of, of eukaryotes as well. And so I think we, with specimen independent barcoding, we can really shift the Sisyphean struggle. And I think we can really be part of an incredible uh, movement towards understanding biodiversity on the planet. And there's a lovely quote from Albert Camus. I'm in Canada, so I have to do some of my lecture in French. Um, so the, the struggle towards the summit itself, so that, that single struggle towards the summit that Sisyphus is involved in, is enough to fill the, the, the heart or the life of a human being. Yeah? And Albert Camus says that we must imagine we're human beings. Our life is pointless on the planet. The sun's going to go out. You know, there is no point to life. But we must imagine Sisyphus happy. And that's what we're doing. We're involved, engaged in a Sisyphean task, and it's glorious. It's absolutely glorious. Anyway, uh, thank Clara and Martin again, and you for listening.